So my talk today is going to be about Surfidet, uh, which is the group that I worked on for most of my uh, post-secondary career. It's not what I'm currently working on for my postdoc, but it's certainly the group that are sort of my first love and what I would consider my main research focus. Uh, Surfidet are also known as flower flies or hoverflies, uh, commonly in the literature. And this is entitled From Pollinators to Parasitoids, and it's just sort of a general interest uh, natural history talk. So a little bit about me, uh, I kind of consider myself a lifelong naturalist. Uh, I grew up really interested in marine biology, herpetology, paleontology, and entomology. But it wasn't until my undergraduate degree at the University of Guelph uh, where I became seriously interested in entomology, uh, taking a third year entomology course. I actually went there intending to go into herpetology, but after one ent course, I switched all of my courses around and have been doing entomology ever since. Uh, so that's me at age six on the left there, and then 26 on the right. And so as you can see, I've gotten a bit taller, but not much else has changed over the years. Uh, so an introduction to the flower flies. Uh, Surveyed, they're commonly known as flower flies or hover flies. Uh, you'll see the Brits write hover flies as one word with a space in between. Uh, but that's the only group of insects where they write it with uh, an adjective and then fly as a single word, where it's actually true diptera, like dragonflies, uh, damselflies, stoneflies, those are all one word and they're not diptera. Uh, so I always write hoverfly as two words, because all other fly group, true fly groups, so in the order diptera, are written as two words. So flower flies or hoverflies as two separate words is more correct. Uh, it's a fairly large family, not as massive as some of them, but uh, 6,300 or so described species worldwide. Um, they're divided broadly into four subfamilies. Uh, so there's been sort of a recent increase in interest in flower flies uh, over the past, I would say, 10 years or so. Uh, previous to that, it was sort of considered that bees were you know, the insect pollinator. But as more and more people realize that flower flies are actually important native pollinators, uh, both the general interest in the group and also, and you know, in some ways more importantly for researchers, uh, the amount of funding available for flower flies has increased quite a bit. Uh, what makes them extremely appealing for both uh, you know, professional researchers and also amateur entomologists is that most of them are identifiable to genus or even species in the field. And as a matter of fact, with some colleagues of mine from the Canadian National Collection of Insects, we just published a a uh, field guide to the flower flies of northeastern North America, where all 416 species of flower flies found in sort of my corner of North America are identifiable to species in a field guide format. Yeah, we're, we're very proud of it. It just came out uh, in presses a few months ago, and uh, so far uh, the reception has been quite positive. Uh, so flower flies are found in quite a wide range of habitats. They're certainly uh, most at home in sort of moist woodland environments, uh, all the way to tropical rainforests. Uh, they're not overly common or abundant in desert environments, xeric environments, but they're still, they still exist there. And you know, there are still some species that are sort of specialists there. Uh, and they're found in every continent except for Antarctica. Uh, the larvae of flower flies are relatively well known for a group of diptera. Uh, that is to say that we barely know anything about the larvae, but we still know more than most diptera groups. But it is actually the larvae that I'm going to be talking about quite a bit for a large portion of this talk. Uh, mimicry is something that comes up quite commonly within the flower flies, and it's something that's sort of an active area of ongoing research for some people. Uh, Mimics can be broadly uh, sort of uh, separated into two groups. Uh, imperfect mimics, like these two shown, they sort of vaguely resemble a stinging hymenopteran. They're evocative of one. They're black and yellow striped. They have sort of aposematic warning colors, but they're not uh, you know, easy to link to a specific species of stinging insect. insect. So uh, this is what we call an imperfect mimic because it, you know, it may provide some form of defense versus predators that aren't looking too closely at them. And these are more common in smaller flower flies where uh, you know, visual acuity is something that they're banking on where you know, even birds that have better visual acuity than us 
if the insect is small enough and moving quickly, all they really see is black and yellow stripes and they don't bother us. Uh, many larger flower flies, on the other hand, are what we call a perfect mimic. Uh, so on the left here, this is Cryorina nigra ventris, and on the right is a bumblebee. And so, you know, these are species where you can make a pretty close match between the model and the mimic, at least a genus level. And so, yeah, in many cases, these are the larger flies where, uh, you know, simple black and yellow striping might not be enough to save them from a bird that's really paying attention and looking closely. So they have to be uh, sort of a higher fidelity mimic. And I'll be showing a few other examples of that later on. Uh, here's another perfect mimic. So this is Phylomaya fusca. Uh, and on the right, that's the bald-faced hornet. hornet. Uh, this is a fairly large and really painfully stinging hornet that is commonly found throughout northeastern North America. So you can imagine that if you've been stung by that before and you saw a Spilomaya, you might just leave it alone without taking a second glance at it. You also have interesting things like this, where uh, we have a yellow jacket in the top two pictures, both uh, sitting on a flower and in flight, and then a tenostoma in the bottom. So this is a flower fly, and as you can see, it doesn't have long antenna like a hymenopter, which might give it away. But its forelegs are colored black, and they actually hold them in front of them like their antenna. Even in flight, they'll always hold their forelimbs out in front of them, and it looks more or less like the antenna of a wasp, especially if they're moving quickly, which they're quite able to do. So in some cases where they don't have you know, perfect mimicry in some ways, or if you look at a dead specimen, it doesn't seem like a perfect mimic. When they're alive, all of a sudden, they're much more convincing. Uh, so the adult behavior of flower flies is fairly uniform. It can be summed up you know, pretty quickly. Uh, Within most of the subfamilies, the adults feed on pollen and nectar from flowers. They obtain both the carbohydrates they need for sort of daily activity, and also the protein from the pollen that the females especially need in order to develop fertile eggs in their ovaries. Uh, some species of flower flies are known to be migratory. This is research that's mostly been conducted in Europe so far. Uh, it's fairly easy to conduct migratory studies up along the coast of the UK. It's a fairly small system where they understand the fauna of the flower flies extremely well. And it would appear that there's at least uh, three species of flower fly that migrate north and south along the coast in response to uh, annual weather patterns. And so this is something that's really uh, just sort of an incipient area of study in North American flower flies and not studied at all in most places. But we're beginning to realize that there's probably more species than we ever realized that migrate much like uh, many species of birds or butterflies. Uh, the larval behavior, on the other hand, uh, is not as easy to summarize within this family. Uh, for a single family of fly, they show an absolutely stunning diversity of different larval lifestyles, which I'm going to be getting into in a lot more detail throughout this talk. Uh, but very roughly, the sort of general larval strategy can be divided by subfamily, of which there are four I'm going to talk about <laughs> right now. So the surfinae or surfines are often fairly small, shiny, uh, imperfect mimics of stinging hymenoptera, and their larvae are almost always predaceous. Uh, so this is the whole larva on the left. They look sort of like a you know a typical fly larva, like a maggot, but often colored more like a caterpillar. Uh, these are nocturnal predators during the day. They're quite difficult to find, but if you look on the undersides of leaves of plants that are heavily infested by aphids, that's where they're usually resting. At night, they come out from their hiding spot, and they're specialist predators on soft-bodied insects, especially homoptera like the aphids. So this is the head capsule of one you can see on the right there. And what they do is they have these two vertical mouth hooks, and they stab them into an aphid, and then lift them off of the substrate so that their alarm pheromones spread more slowly to the colony around them. And then they suck all the juices out, uh, toss them aside and grab the next aphid. And a single surfid larva can go through several hundred aphids in the time it takes for them to reach maturity and pupate. So they're quite effective predators of aphids, and there's also other individual species that are predators of different soft-bodied insects that I'll be getting into more detail uh, later on. Uh, the pepizinae, the pepizines, uh, this is a subfamily that uh, there aren't really a lot of good photographs of, unfortunately. Uh, but they're generally just sort of, they, they almost all look just like this, honestly. They're small, they're black, they're a little bit fuzzy. And the larvae are more or less like the surfine larvae in that they're just sort of maggot-like creatures. Uh, some of them are exposed on leaf surfaces and behave just the same way surfine larvae do. 
but many of them are slightly more specialist predators and they tend to go for aphids that sequester themselves in some sort of uh, like a hidden microhabitat. So a lot of them are specialist predators on gall aphids, for example. So they actually find a way to enter the gall where the aphids uh, are hiding and they just slowly eat their way through all of the aphids in there. Which is the main reason that it's really hard to find good photographs of their larva because not only are you looking for sort of a tiny maggot-like creature, but they're actually hiding inside the gall that was produced by a different animal. Uh, the microdontines, uh, these are a great little group of serpents. So these are also known as the ant flies. Uh, the adults generally look pretty much like this. They've got a very flat face and they're fuzzy all over. Uh, they sort of break the general adult trend of being feeders on pollen and nectar. Uh, many microdontines are thought not to feed at all as adults, and they never really stray very far from the ant colonies where the larvae live. So these are the larvae. They're really interesting little creatures. They're sort of these domed armadillo-like creatures that have a hardened, sclerotized exoskeleton on the top half. Uh, this is actually the head end, whereas that is the posterior respiratory spiracles, and that's the head sticking out there. And so these are all inquilines, as far as we know, inside ant colonies. And so they produce uh, cuticular hydrocarbons that fool the ants into thinking that they are ant brood, just like all of the pupil ants and juvenile ants in the colony. And that leaves them uh, the ability to kind of just shuffle through the ant colony with impunity and slowly eat as many ant brood as they need to in order to pupate. Uh, the adults actually don't have these same chemical defenses, though. So when they do go to pupate, they have to pupate right at the uh, exit to the ant colony, and then when the adult fly emerges from the puparium, they just run like crazy to escape the ants, because at that point they do have uh, no defenses and would get eaten otherwise. Uh, finally, the Aristolines are the last of the four subfamilies that are currently considered valid. Uh, these are a lot harder to characterize in terms of the larval life histories. So there's the sort of classic rat-tailed maggots that you find in tree holes, and uh, ephemeral pools, and also latrines in a lot of places. Uh, these are microbial grazers. They essentially are filter feeders that are sucking water through their mouth parts and then filtering out all the bacteria and tiny food particles and just slowly feeding on that. Essentially a very low protein but easy to access diet. And that uh, long posterior respiratory spiracle that forms the rat tail, that acts like a uh, snorkel for them. So they can uh, submerge themselves in uh, shallow water and then just have that siphon sticking up and breathe while they just slowly munch their way along the bottom of shallow water. Uh, there's also a completely different aristaline uh, larva though, Temnostoma. These are the mimics that hold their legs in front of them on the fly. They have these strange grub-like creatures that I'll talk about later, as well as Sphagina that has sort of a very short rat tail and they have a totally different larval lifestyle, which again I'll get into later on. So I'm just going to get really briefly into the phylogenetics of the Serpidae to make uh, one point clear here. So if we have, this is a bit of an older tree, but it still shows uh, what I'm trying to illustrate here. So if we superimpose the different subfamilies onto this phylogeny, you can see that the Serpines, the Microdontines, not the Aristolines, and the Pipizines are monophyletic. So three of these families form a single lineage where they, it includes the uh, common ancestor and all of their descendants, whereas the Aristolines form at least two major groups of different evolutionary lineages. So what this means is that within the Aristolines, the non-monophyletic group, we can't really make predictions about their life cycle as easily because they don't actually form a single natural evolutionary unit. So it's not surprising that the larval life histories are extremely varied within the Aristolines. Uh, so most of the remainder of the talk, I'm going to be talking about specific natural history and larval diversity of some other really interesting serpents. So this is just sort of a broad overview of the family with highlights from some of the really interesting genera. So I'm going to be talking about some of the surfine highlights first of all. So again, these are your aphid specialists. Uh, Dazzy Surface is a group that a close friend of mine reviewed for her master's project back in Canada. And they have a specific larval behavior where they wrap themselves around a twig. So the adults, again, are just sort of this generic, uh, imperfect mimic of stinging Hymenoptera. The larvae look like this. They have all these spikes all over them. And what they usually do while they're in feeding mode is they'll wrap themselves around a narrow twig or a stem on an arboreal plant of some sort. So these are often high up in the trees. 
And they just wrap themselves around this twig and they wait for another insect to walk by, uh, usually a caterpillar or a sawfly larva. Uh, in this case, it's actually a lady beetle larva. And uh, once something touches one of those uh, many spikes that sticks out from their side, they're sort of fleshy, you know, tentacle-like structures, they just lash out and grab them and they start feeding on them. So these are an ambush predator and they let the prey come to them and they, uh, they just sit on these twigs and they wait all day and that's how they feed. Uh, again, a little bit weird, but it gets much weirder. Uh, this was in a paper that was simply called A Remarkable Aquatic Predator Within the Surfines. Uh, this is Ossetamus wolkianus. It was, uh, again, described by a colleague of mine. And these are an aquatic predator. So these are found only in bromeliad cups in the New World. It was described from Brazil. And these are generalist predators in bromeliad cups. So again, you know, this is an epiphytic plant that collects water, and there's sort of uh, a specialized microhabitat within that. And then you have these larvae that have this posterior suction cup and an elongated siphon again that allows them to fasten themselves to the edge of one of these plants and stick their head in the water with these posterior respiratory spiracles sticking out of the water like a snorkel. And as different insects swim by, they grab them with their mouth hooks and again, suck the juices out. And so this is again, you know, it's something where most of the uh, members of the genus are feeding on aphids, but this has moved into an, a, a, an aquatic habitat to uh, achieve sort of a similar goal. Uh, Ossiptemus myeophagus is another species within the same genus. This is a massive genus in the neotropics. Uh, and this was in a paper that was called A Fly Larva That Preys on Adult Flies, uh, which is appropriate because myeophagus, <coughs> the specific epithet, uh, literally means fly eater. Uh, so these are specialists in white fly colonies. They are actually first discovered on the campus of a uh, Brazilian university. And they all have this white spot uh, there's not a point to it, I don't think. Here we go. So this is the larva here with the head end up there. They all have sort of a white fat body on them that have, helps break up their outline and make them look like bird poop. And they hang around uh, white flies, which are, uh, you know, an aphid-like creature that produces lots of honeydew. But they don't eat the white flies themselves. What they're actually doing is waiting for adult flies who are coming to that honeydew to feed on it. And then they spit sticky saliva that is also uh, mildly paralytic at these flies that are coming in to feed on the honeydew, paralyze them, wrap them up in their saliva, and then squirm their way over to them and again feed on them. So this is something that is using honeydew as bait and it's living in the exact same larval habitat that other Ossotamus larvae would, you know, around soft-bodied homopterans, but they're instead feeding on insects that are coming to feed from the excretions of these homopterans. So again, this is pretty weird for that subfamily. Uh, we're also starting to get sort of unconfirmed reports from different naturalists that this sort of behavior might be a little more widespread than we thought. Uh, someone sent me a video on Twitter recently of a completely unrelated surfid larva that actually spat saliva at a bee that was harassing it, and it didn't do it to kill the bee, but uh, it did entangle the bee's legs and the bee left it alone after that. So it could be that these surfids actually have sticky saliva that they use as defensive secretions in most cases. And in this case, it's sort of you know, co-evolved that for uh, offensive purposes as well. Uh, there's also a few non-predaceous surfines. So again, this is a subfamily that I mentioned is generally predaceous, but uh, Allograptus centribogonus, this is again a new world species. Uh, it's a leaf miner uh, in Campanulaceae, and it's found in Costa Rica. So there's a couple pictures. You can see the larva inside the leaf mines. And then uh, once they're finished feeding inside the leaf tissue, they emerge from the edges of the leaves, as you can see here. And then they pupate on the outside of the leaves. Uh, and you know, it emerges adults and breed. Uh, Toxomerus politis, uh, which this was fairly recently published, like late 90s, in a paper called Pollen Feeding Larva in the Presumed Predatory Surfine Genus. So Toxomerus is a massive new world group of what was thought to be entirely predaceous flower flies, but this species at least feeds on pollen uh, as a larva. So you know they've gone from an extremely protein-rich diet of feeding on aphids to a moderately rich protein diet of feeding on pollen instead. Uh, they're also known to feed. They're commonly found feeding on corn pollen. Uh, it's actually uh, supposedly these were known to be Aztecs. The ancient Aztecs. There's some indication that 
they understood that when these larvae were abundant, then the, uh, the maize harvest or corn harvest that year was supposed to be particularly good. Uh, unfortunately, there isn't much written recorded history from the Aztecs that remains, so the evidence for this is somewhat circumstantial. Uh, so to get into the microdontians, these are the ant flies again. So these are all the inclines within ant nests. I'm going to be talking a little bit more about them. So again, these are obviously highly specialized to begin with. Uh, and they're actually so unusual looking, they were originally described as mollusks. And they were described as mollusks seven times independently before someone realized that these were actually an insect. Uh, less than 8% of the larvae for the known species have been described though. So this is generally a subfamily where we can say some things about the larva, but there's probably a lot of surprises left that we don't know about yet. So this is sort of just a picture of them in situ. So this is in a Campanotus nest. Uh, this is a picture taken by my old advisor. And uh, yeah, so you can see the ants don't seem to know it's there, and they can just slowly work their way through the colony, eating as many immature ants as they want. Uh, and there's an underside view. So this was taken on a piece of glass, and you can see up here is the head end, and that's what they, they have these two little tentacle-like structures they use for sensing, and they're just going to be slowly feeding on as many ants as they want, and they grab an immature one and pull it underneath that shell so they can feed. Uh, this was the first paper that described them. Uh, I don't speak German, but uh, I knew Landschlecken Gassung, uh, which is a new genus of land snail. Uh, and there's, it's actually an excellent illustration of the larva. It's just it's not a snail or a slug or anything at all. And what happened was uh, this author, Von Spix, and another uh, sort of general invertebrate taxonomist at the time, apparently they hated each other, and so there was a rivalry between them. So once Von Spix described one, the other guy described one as fast as he could, and that's why there were seven descriptions of these new mollusks where someone finally took a look and realized that they were dipter larvae, not <laughs> mollusks at all. And they're pretty weird. Uh, so there's a couple, the, there's only diagrams of this one, unfortunately. I've never see, found a picture of them. But this is known as the upside down microdon larva. It's found in Microdon penimonensis, as well as the genus Rapalosurfus. And so it has this giant fleshy underside and then just a flat covering on top. And no one really knows what sort of competitive advantage that would offer them. It seems like it would only make them more vulnerable to attacks from ants, not less so. Mm -hmm. So we don't know why they look like that at all, but they're just kind of strange. Uh, here's a, a puparium from another species, Paramicrodon, just to show off some of the sort of diversity of different uh, morphologies you see in this subfamily. And uh, finally, in a hypsilo surface, this was in a paper called uh, An Unusual But Not Unexpected Evolutionary Step. And so these are actually parasitoids uh, of ant pupae. So they're ectoparasitoids. They live on the outside of a pupating ant, but inside the cocoon that the ant spins around itself to protect itself. And here's pictures of it in action. So you can see up here, this is an ant cocoon that's been cut open to show what's going on. And there's a half deflated but still alive ant pupa here with a little larva attached on it dorsally. And then here's a close-up of the larva itself. And finally, the adult fly emerging from what used to be the ant pupa. So we know of at least one species where instead of feeding on many ant brood over the course of its life, uh, you know, juvenile lifetime, uh, these have developed sort of a more intimate relationship and they're feeding on a single uh, ant brood over uh, a longer period. So it's an ectoparasitoid. It's quite likely there's more ectoparasitoids within the subfamily. But as I said, only 8% of the larvae from known species have been described. So there's all sorts we still don't know about this subfamily. Uh, and finally, Nothomicrodon, SPO. Uh, this was described 2008, I believe, uh, as a very tiny species of Microdon. Uh, eventually realized it's not a Microdontian at all. It's also not a surfeit. Uh, this is a forward larva that just happens to look superficially like a Microdontian. Someone finally went back to the original collecting locality, recaptured some, reared them out, and it turns out it's a forward fly, a scuttle fly, not a surfeit at all. It was originally described as one. So like I said, there's still a lot of surprises for us, especially within this subfamily. Uh, the Aristolines. So as I mentioned before, uh, this is the group where it's hard to make generalizations about them because they shouldn't be considered a single subfamily at all. There are quite a few different evolutionary lineages. 
but I'm going to be talking about some of the highlights nonetheless. Uh, and as we haven't split them up into multiple subfamilies yet, I'll just leave them together. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is Chrysogaster hitella. Uh, this is a whole arctic genus, so they're found in North America and Northern Europe. Uh, the larvae live in sort of shallow nutrient-rich ponds like the other Aristoline larvae, the rat tail maggots I described before. Uh, they don't have that long rat tail though. Instead what they have is a sharp piercing siphon. And these are specially modified so that they can pierce them into hollow stems of emergent plants. And, they use the, and then they use the plant stem itself as a snorkel. So they breathe the air that's in the center of the plant stem and they just sit there motionless, slowly filter feeding as water passes by them uh, with their extended snorkel that they've uh, you know, used this plant for. Uh, bulb feeding, so uh, this is another form of sort of indirect plant feeding or sometimes direct plant feeding that's quite common in the subfamily. Uh, is also uh, seen in at least three genera and one of these genera should probably be split into quite a few more. So it's seen in you know, several lineages of deristolines. And there's two different categories of bulb feeding. Uh, and by bulbs, I'm talking about the uh, sort of dormant root stage of uh, a lot of plants that are from the Mediterranean, like tulips and daffodils. And, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a plant person. Tulips and daffodils, we'll say. Uh, but yeah, there's two categories of bulb feeding plants. Uh, there's rot inducers. So these are something that I would consider saprophagous. So they're actually feeding on bacteria and true bulb feeders. So rot inducers, what they'll do is they'll gnaw at the tip of a healthy bulb uh, and cause that bulb to start to decay. So they kill it, but they're not actually feeding on the plant tissue. They need that decay so that fungus and bacteria start to evade the bulb, and then they filter feed on the kind of gross, mushy liquid soup that starts to form as the bulb breaks down. Whereas true bulb feeders are actually phytophagous insects, and they're gnawing away at the bulb and eating the plant tissue and giving the nutrients directly from that. Uh, so these are generally what the bulb feeders look like. They're just sort of short, fat, fleshy larvae. They often have sort of a flat cap on the posterior end that may provide them a small amount of protection when they're inside the bulb. And then this is actually, over here, damage to the bulb of an allium plant. Uh, allium, I believe, is wild garlic. Uh, yeah, so humerus. It's the one genus, uh, and these would be the rot inducers, whereas true bulb feeders include Meridon and Portvinia. Uh, so Humerus is the top one, and then Meridon and Portvinia are these bottom two. Meridon is probably sort of a complex of unrelated groups, and eventually it'll be split into more genera, but uh, they're not really my specialty group, so I'm going to have to wait for someone else to uh, do that work before I can comment further there. Uh, there's also quite a few different unrelated species of aristaline surfids that are saprot feeders. Uh, so saprons uh, under the bark of fallen trees. Uh, this is just a quote that I took from a surfid paper. I found it was particularly evocative. Uh, Graham Rotheray says that when a tree or branch falls, the sap under the bark decays and sometimes forms a thick, wet, pungent smelling layer, which is rich in food for hoverfly larvae. So this is essentially decaying sap that's full of bacteria and fungal spores. And there's quite a few surfids that are adapted to this sort of semi-liquid, gooey medium, slowly filter feeding their way through that. Uh, by the way, Christian, there's a live Seriana, so that perf yeah. This is a great example of a so-called perfect mimic of wasps. Uh, most people see these flies and they don't even realize they're looking at a fly, and they won't go near them because they're afraid of being stung. They're really fantastic. Uh, in life, they'll actually flip their wings like a hymenoptera that's questing as well, so they have behavioral mimicry as well. Yeah, they're fun. Uh, and so this is sort of a, a classic example of what mostly sap rock, sap rock feeders look like. They have a very short sort of posterior respiratory snorkel, so this allows them to breathe while moving through uh, you know, a thin layer of rotting sap, but it wouldn't be enough for them to actually submerge themselves in water and swim around and breathe at the same time. Uh, Tendostoma, so these are these uh, the wasp mimics that will often hold their legs in front of them to mimic uh, antenna of wasps. Uh, these are quite common in woodlands where the fallen trees aren't removed and are allowed to decay over time. Uh, they're very common in North America where we have you know a relatively high proportion of primary boreal forest left. They're often they're also found in Europe, 
but because Europe was so heavily managed for so long, and in many cases completely clear cut, uh, the same species are sometimes found in both North America and Europe, but what we would call a common species in North America is extremely rare in Europe just because they don't have these same forest ecosystems where logs have been left to rot over generations. So these are what the larvae look like. Uh, and these, again, are true wood feeders. So they have these two rasps at the front of the thorax. They're little scrapers. And they use these to very slowly bore their way through solid fallen logs. And they're ingesting the wood particles as well as fungal spores and gaining tiny amounts of nutrition over a long period of time. While also gaining a large amount of protection from the fact that they're completely encased within solid wood. Uh, there's the tunnels there. So you can see there's a larva that's slowly been boring its way through wood that really isn't that rotten at all. And uh, the life cycle of these is quite long. So the average temnostoma species spends about two years as a larva boring its way through logs before they finally emerge as an adult, at which point they may only live for a few weeks or months. So you know, oftentimes with these hollow metabolous insects like flies, we think of the adults as sort of the main stage or the main life cycle. But in reality, the adult is sort of a winged dispersal phase that's meant for mating, reproducing, laying eggs, and dying, whereas the larva is what does the majority of the sort of living of the organism, or has the longest lifespan. And on that note, uh, Calicera erratica, these are species that live in tree holes, usually of pine trees or oak trees, depending on the species. Uh, these can live up to seven years as a larva. So this is something that uh, in both Europe and North America, where they're native to, they're thought to be an extremely rare species because they're only flying for a few weeks a year. They're actually not rare at all. When people start sampling arboreal tree holes where the larvae are found, they find them in virtually every tree that's a decent habitat for them. It's just that they're only common as the larva and therefore very hard for us to find because they spend seven years as the larva and then two weeks as an adult and then they die. So they're very common, it's just the adults are very, very short-lived. They're also gorgeous, so you know, every uh, flower fly enthusiast wants to catch one of these out of the collection. Uh, Volucella, this is another weird aristoline. They have a completely atypical lifestyle for the average aristoline. So these are inclines of social hymenoptera. So they're not quite the same as the microdontians that are actually feeding on the larva of social hymenoptera like ants. These are generally found in annual wasp nests, so yellow jacket nests where the, the nest only lives for a single year and they die during the winter. And they tend to live at the very bottom of the nest where there's sort of detritus and refuse piles of you know, insect feces and dead bits of wasp and things like that. And they just munch their way through the detritus fairly peacefully. Uh, they're most commonly found in vested wasp nests, but people have occasionally found them in other forms of wasp nests as well. And there's also one species that has a completely different la uh, larval life cycle and they're actually a sap run feeder, like some of the uh, earlier slides I talked about. So we don't really know if there was multiple independent evolutions of sap run feeding here, or if Folicella maybe is not really a monophyletic group or what. But there's something that needs a little more further study, and the sort of two completely divergent larva lifestyles sty indicates that maybe we don't quite understand the phylogeny here properly. Or they're just strange. Could be that too. This is what the larvae look like. They have all these long spines over them, although we don't know what they actually do. Uh, there's generally a diapause in the larva, uh, so often they'll do most of their feeding in early summer, and then they just wait and they don't emerge yet because it wouldn't be safe for them because of all the live wasps in the colony. They wait till the wasp queens die, the workers stop defending the brood and start sort of, uh, you know, the nest breaks up, and that's when they actually emerge and leave the nest. So again, they're like the, uh, Microdon, where they don't have any protection from the adults, uh, from the wasps as an adult, so they have to have some sort of strategy for exiting the nest without getting eaten by the wasps. So in their case, they just wait, and then they overwinter as an adult. So you know, most of these are most common in places where we have a pretty harsh winter. There's going to be you know a foot or more of snow on the ground, and so as an adult, they just hide under the bark of a large tree or under leaf litter where they're somewhat protected from the cold, and they'll be breeding again in the spring and then continuing the life cycle. Uh, Nepenthesurphus. So this is a fairly strange old world Asian species. Uh, they're quite common in Thailand from what I've seen in collections, but I don't know where else they can be found. That's you know, virtually the only place I've seen long series of them is from 
rubber plantations in Thailand for whatever reason. Uh, they have predatory semi-aquatic larvae, and you know, again, I'm not a botanist, but if you uh, know your botany at all, then the penthosurface is a bit of a hint, because these larvae are only found in pitcher plants, and in their case, mostly on the ground level pitcher plants as opposed to the arboreal ones. So we don't know exactly what they're feeding on, if they have a specialty within that, but they're probably generalist predators of any insect that falls within the pitcher. And we also don't understand how they themselves aren't digested by the pitcher plant like other things that fall in. But that's the only larval habitat known in the genus is within these pitcher plants. So again, they're pretty cool and they have this strange specialized larval life cycle. We'd really like to know more about them, but the genus as a whole really is sort of poorly understood. Hylosia is the last Aristoline genus I'm going to be talking about today. And they encompass you know, a good half of the different life cycles I've uh, talked about in the past 20 minutes or so. This genus does almost everything. So they have saprophages that live in rotting plants as well as saprons. They have phytophages, so true plants.